Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today on our design focus day for Intersect Chicago slash SOFA. The fair will be live and open to the public through November 12th and will live on on Artsy till December 5th. I'm Becca Hoffman, Managing Director of Intersect Art and Design. Today, I'm pleased to welcome our partner, the River North Design District. Founded in 2013, it is a local community of more than 70 members boasting interior design offerings accessible to both designers and consumers. Their showrooms carry everything from lighting to tile to plumbing to rugs, kitchens, and furnishings. Everything one needs to create a one-of-a-kind home. The showrooms pride themselves on providing a shopping experience that is both unique and personalized. Each is located on street level, allowing consumers to stroll through and enjoy the neighborhood. This afternoon's talk is organized by Jill Merrimont and, on, and is entitled Designer Insights, Buying Art in Changing Times. It will be led by Chicago Gallery News' Ginny Van Alea and will include four esteemed Chicago designers who will share how their art selecting has changed due to the current climate. Panelists are Steve Cadlick, Cadlick Architecture and Design, Bruce Fox, Bruce Fox Design, Jill Malott, Studio 6F, and Trina Sandshaper, Taylor Slater. Now I'll turn it over to Jill. Please enjoy the discussion and please feel free to post any questions into the chat box. Also, don't forget to check out the fair live at intersectchicago.com. And additionally, please check out the two studio tours featured on River North Design District's page as well. Thank you again. Thanks, Becca. So thank you everyone for joining us today for Designer Insights, Buying mm -hmm. Art and Changing Times. So we hope that you'll visit our partner page as um, as Becca as Becca mentioned. Uh, we have 14 of River North Design District's designers um, who have curated selects um, along with two studio tours, one from Lucy Slavinsky and one from Link Taitlin. Um, so those are also posted on our partner page. Um, so today you can tune in live for a tour with Link Talon at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time or 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so now I'm going to introduce our esteemed panelists. So first we have Steve Cadlack from Cadlack Architecture and Design. So his business, Cadlack Architecture and Design was founded in 2004 and his firm creates quietly confident and curated spaces, which are thoughtfully approached and client-centered. And he has offices in Chicago and Harbor Country, and his projects are currently in Chicago, Michiana, Naples, Palm Springs, Connecticut, and LA. So Steve and his team have been featured in dozens of publications, including El Decor, Lux Gallery, The Wall Street Journal, and House Beautiful, and um, Steve and his team recently just accepted a Lux Red Award. So Bruce Fox from Bruce Fox Design is up next. Um, with more than 20 years of expertise, Bruce Fox is known for his discerning eye and exacting standards. Bruce's work ranges from country estates and second homes to primary city and suburban residences. His work has been featured in Architectural Digest and Lux and received the 2016 Acanthus Award for Excellence in Classical and Vernacular Design from the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, ICAA, from the Chicago Midwest chapter. And next we have uh, Gil Malat with Studio 6F. So Studio 6F is a luxury creative design company focusing on high-end residential and boutique hospitality interior design. So it operates out of its award-winning design gallery and showroom in Chicago. The firm represents founder and principal Gil Malote's eponymous furniture brand, Gil Malote Bespoke. Additionally, they showcase highly sought after vintage furniture, American contemporary makers and artists representing a variety of mediums. Studio 6F's domestic and international projects have been recognized for an unapologetic approach to integrating eras and styles into an eclectic yet harmonious point of view. Their work has been published in the Wall Street Journal, Architectural Digest, Traditional Home, Rue, Lux, Modern Luxury, and they recently participated in the first Dibs virtual show house. 
Next up, we have Trina Sandschaefer from Kaler Slater. Kaler Slater is a dynamic collective of marketplace experts and creative thinkers. Their growth is informed by a rich legacy of over 100 years. The creative energy of, our stu of their studio supports dialogue and innovation. With projects around the US, Canada, and Singapore, Keller Slater's team includes marketplace experts in residential corporate, hospitality, wellness, sports, healthcare, and higher education. And today we have Trina Sanchefer here today who recently launched the Keller Slater Chicago office. And finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Jenny Van Alea. Um, Jenny has been the publisher and owner of Chicago Gallery News, the area's most comprehensive guide to galleries, art services, and events since 2007. Jenny first began working for Chicago Gallery News founding publisher Natalie Von Stratton in 2002 as well as for Chicago Art Dealers Association. So today, Chicago Gallery News publishes 160 page annual arts guides, summer and fall magazines, and also their online magazine, which is chicagogallerynews.com. You can follow the magazine at Shy Gallery News on social media. So, um, with that note, Ginny, you want to get started? Sure. Well, thank you, Jill, and thank you to Becca and everybody at Intersect. Um, I should say that CGN has been a participant in SOFA since the beginning, um, so we're thrilled to still be involved in a new way um, in 2020. So this is a really exciting chance to get your insights um, and overlap between design and art, which is a topic near and dear to my heart and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm gonna turn things mostly over to my four experts and just going to kind of go down a, a short list of topics and have you offer your insights one at a time as best we can with, with Zoom. Um, and then later, as we get a little further, um, we'll open it up for, for comments and chat from all of our attendees. Um, but my first topic is centered obviously on 2020, a year that has thrown everybody for a loop, um, as well as provided, I think, a lot of opportunities for really thinking outside of the box, probably way more than you're even used to um, in your design capacity. But I'd like to hear, in this case, from each of you, maybe we'll start with Trina, um, please talk about how each of you thinks art buying has changed specifically in 2020. And then as a follow-up, if you can add, you know, do you think that some of these changes are going to be longer term. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think the biggest thing that we have seen in 2020 in terms of art is the shift toward digital viewing. Um, we're all figuring that out together. And what I like about digital viewing is that it makes it actually more accessible. I think it's accessible to everyone, wherever they may be, if they don't need to go to the gallery. Um, I'm a big fan of galleries. I don't think galleries will go away, but just like we're thinking about hybrid work, I think hybrid art shows will continue. And then I also see a trend this year. Um, people are asking more about the story of the artist or the piece and getting to know more about the background. And I think that's gonna continue as well. And I'm excited about that. Sure. I, I guess that's me. Right. So uh, my, I, I, I look at it in two ways. I think that there is a, certainly there's a, a growth in equity of exposure. So um, the, the, there's a larger mass of people that have uh, the opportunity to experience art, which I think is now something that is much more um, relevant to not only the experience of, of um, you know, people that may not have had the ability to see art as something that was accessible. Um, but now that they can, um, they see that it is at different price points uh, and um, at different, um, uh, in different uh, venues that they may not have been able to see before. I think that's something that's very important and, and new and I think sustainable. I think the other thing that's very interesting, you know, we've seen um, the, uh, the rise of people of color and their work being more prevalent. 
Um, and I also believe that's very, very sustainable. I look at a guy like the CMO of Artsy, um, Everett Taylor, and what he's done to bring art uh, of, of people of color really to the forefront and bringing you know, their experience uh, at Artsy as an example of what's happening online um, to folks uh, in ways that they've never had before. And so I think that those are two just touch points um, that are very, very different. But I see that you know, my consumers, my, my own clients, um, reach out that way. And I see, you know, my nieces and nephew looking at art in a very, very different way. So I think those are two things that are prevalent, um, but also uh, long lasting. Okay. I think that if I can jump in, that is a good point. Whereas I said art buying, but there's obviously so much that's beyond just the, the transactional element. Of yeah, I think there, yeah, I believe it's, it's, it's a, you know, if I look, I could, I could back it up and, and look at how do I purchase art, but I think that purchasing art is an experience that a multitude of people are now involved in. And I think that that's really what's the more long, long lasting process. Great, thank you. Steve, you wanna jump in? Sure. Um, well, I think that one of the, you know, one of the things about, um, I think tr trending over the last um, few years, um, art shows and sort of more accessibility to art, people being more engaged, uh, whether it's uh, because it's become sort of a popular thing to do, which is not a bad thing. Um, but over the last year, um, as we've sort of adjusted for uh, doing um, remote and digital kind of communication presentations, um, even you know furniture installations um, as uh, um, in a remote fashion, I think that um, art is also something that can be um, experienced and, and viewed much easier um, you know, now than it maybe had had been in, in the past. But I think that there's also a, a, a missing component of, of actually kind of understanding and, and seeing the tactile quality of, of the art. So I think there's this bridge between viewing things that can be for, you know, recommendation and selection versus actually experience a piece of art, you know, in, in person. So um, I think digitally, it's a great way to, um, to get a client to understand kind of a direction and an interest. Um, I think it doesn't replace sort of seeing pieces and, and even the, the art shows are traveling. I think ultimately, as we get past this sort of pandemic, I think we'll get probably even a, more of a focus on people wanting to travel um, to see things in person um, to just replace the uncertainty that's, you know, as much as there's positive things that have come out of this, it um, the, the, person to person kind of contact and the piece to piece, you know, viewer to art contact is something I think that doesn't go away uh, or get replaced digitally. Right. Bruce, what are your thoughts? What are my thoughts? What was the question? <laughs> well, it's, I'm going last. Yes. The, uh, how is art buying or the, in the access to art? maybe changed in 2020. Our question has evolved a little bit as we've gone. Yeah, it has, it has. Um, it's really interesting because when I look at that, um, I always say my clients are so individual and they seem to be, you know, addressing it individually themselves as well. Um, you know, one, you know, several clients that I have use art consultants. And so that really hasn't changed because the consultants are finding the art and, you know, helping them build their collection. And so the client do often doesn't see the piece anyway. You know, they'll see a picture of it, but won't necessarily see it in, in real time or real life. Um, so that part of it, you know, hasn't really, hasn't really changed. You know, they continue to purchase, they continue, you know, to pursue their collections. Um, you know, on the other hand, I do have a client that, you know, just went on first dibs and bought a piece and, I, you know, you know, I, I, I worked with her to figure it out and she's like, I love it. I found it on first dibs and I'm like, well, let's pursue it. And, you know, it showed up. Um, the other, the other interesting thing that's been going on are fundraisers that are using art. Um, you know, those clearly, you know, have been around for a while, but um, another client just bought a piece of art, you know, to, to benefit um, artists and people that are suffering, um, you know, or, or a food bank, you know, whatever, whatever it is that they're, um, you know, benefiting. But um, yeah, it's, um, it's, people are, people are still hungry to hang art on their walls, especially when they're stuck at home. 
and they're finding a way to do it. I think the fact that there are so many things actually that are the same is, is almost as interesting. I mean, but we're also having this conversation in November of 2020 versus in April, uh, yeah. which might have been a lot more panicked. Um, you know, we've all managed to kind of reimagine how we do business as well as how we, you know, keep the things that we love in our, in our lives. Um, I think that would lead me to my next question is you mentioned uh, your, Bruce, your clients are still working with art consultants. Um, and that's one level of, of thinking about art in your home. Um, are there other ways that each of you has clients that are changing their homes significantly so far this year, and then therefore thinking about how art fits. I mean, for instance, expansion into outdoor spaces or more, you know, at home offices or even people moving to larger spaces or different spaces and then thinking now I have a whole new environment and I need, I need to be able to find art to, to fit that new environment. If we, we could, you can jump in or we can start with Trina again, but um, particularly you're on sort of the architecture and design side. Um, what do you think is a new consideration for clients about having art in their, in their spaces where they're spending more time? Yeah, I think across the board, we're seeing people, people want things that bring them joy in their home. And so art for a lot of people does that. And I think the more time that people are spending at home, the more they're realizing maybe their art changes seasonally or has a different feel uh, throughout the year or based on um, whether you're inside or outside. I would say the other thing that I'm seeing, and this is just me personally, is I'm working at all types of scales. So from single family homes to multifamily projects, hospitality and corporate, I think art is just coming more into the forefront across all scales again and that it's because it it brings that moment of happiness um, in the space and also it helps tell a story it can align with how people feel in their space or how you could might feel um, at a hospitality suite and I think that people are looking for that anyone else have clients that are looking at art in new ways for for their all their time at home well, I, I just had, um, you know, several clients just finishing their residences just as COVID was hitting. So, you know, you know, rugs were, you know, stranded in, you know, India and not being able to come over. And so the process just sort of halted. But, you know, as time has gone on during COVID, the projects that actually finished and, and you know, so they're looking at it. I, I, I really do think they're you know, wanting to complete the residences because, you know, you do, but I think it in a different way, like, cause some people will not, you know, may not finish the art or may not finish accessorizing, but I think I'm seeing clients really want to complete it. You know, I think COVID has sparked people to, you know, to create that environment that is really warm and a safe place for them. Um, and that includes the beautiful things that you put around you. Um, you know, the art, the accessories, you know, whatever it is. Um, so that's one thing that I've noticed. Art tends to be the, uh, you know, a, a tertiary um, column in the, in the budget and decision-making um, part of design and architecture. You know, so we build the house, that's a large column of, pri of, of, fun of funding. And we fill it with, you know, fabulous pieces of furniture and rugs and accessories. And art tends to be this third column that we, if we're lucky, we have money to spend and, um, and fill it with pieces, right? And what I have found, the folks that are still, still continuing to fill that, you know, and, and spend in that column now have a, additional decision points. Um, you know, I think we're all saying much of the same thing. Those decision points now encompass things that are, are, have a much more holistic um, uh, uh, veil or, or filter with them. So it's beyond, does it, fill, does it fill the room with volume, right? But does it fill the room with a spirit that we now want in our home? Does it fill the room with a warmth uh, of family that we've, we've come to experience? Does it fill the room with you know, this community that we're trying to create? So does it do those things beyond is the color correct, right? 
is it does it have a provenance? It may or it may not, but it's more important than does it have these uh, experiences that we're trying to create. I think now that column is just as important. And I think that, you know, we've started a couple of new projects and we're starting really at this end with art as important as the initial decision, as the, as the first, it's in the first decision, you know? Let's start with a piece of art as the inspiration for our design decisions. And hopefully we'll buy that piece of art, but let's start there because we've now found that that's a comfort piece in our experiences having been hunkered down for so long. And so let's use that and let's move that number over here in this column, you know, where we're making some foundational expenditures and make that a foundation to the process. And I think that's what's happening in that expense. And I think that's a decision that's very, very different than where it might've been certainly nine months ago or, or 14 months ago was a heck of a lot different. I think that's where it's changing for us. And I think that if we're doing our job, you know, certainly with our group, um, that's what we'll be doing moving forward. Let's just help move this over. That speaks to, you know, your comment earlier, I think Bruce also, but it's so personal and so subjective. It, there's no one, there's no one theme, but to see that kind of shift is pretty remarkable of, of getting to that a little bit earlier because it's, because it might become a slightly, you know, on par with some of the finishes that normally happen in the, in the second column, as you said. Yeah, I think that I have um, you know, several clients that, you know, I'm sure like all, all of us that have, because they've been at home, because they've been forced into a situation of routine that's different, they really are becoming much more cognizant of the space they occupy. I mean, in that, in that way that when it's almost could be transactional when you think if you buy a home and you furnish it, you've got to do the certain things in order for you to move in and often art and accessories become a thing that is, you know, either from fatigue of spending, you know, gets put as a lower priority. Um, and then when you're in a home that's half finished and you realize, well, wait a minute, this doesn't quite feel right yet. And now I've been working and living uh, from this space for several months. I understand what it means to have, you know, the, the total of, of the environment feel complete. So I think that's, that's a motivator um, definitely have clients that want to come in and finish their homes. And it's, you know, it's, it's often that it doesn't get finished in the first installation. Um, I also have clients that are doing more custom pieces, whether, you know, architectural or lighting, um, seeking things that are unique. Um, so even within a space that's, you know, that can be conventional, whether it's a developer home or, a, you know, apartment, um, still wanting to find that uniqueness that kind of allows them to feel like they have a more personal connection with, with their space. And I think that's really is a great thing that's come out of 2020 um, uh, for us, a, a better recognition of the value of um, design and art in just our well being. Well, certainly for the time being, there's been a, an emphasis for, for a lot of people on, you know, it used to be location and you wanted to be in a city and you would spend most of your time out in that city. And we've been restricted, you know, more so than anybody has experienced recently. So your own personal space has a different kind of weight um, for your day to day than maybe it did before. Um, thinking about that, uh, I don't know how, how your balance is for each of you on the, the corporate side versus, you know, sort of individual, maybe residential design. Um, have you seen that you're, because you're not, are you doing more corporate spaces? You're, I mean, the corporate and hospitality, I should say, there's a question in the chat. Um, isn't hospitality and corporate buying way down this year, you know, and do you see that recovering? And how does that, how does that affect your business? I'll take that one. Uh, certainly it, it's less this year than in years past, but I think, um, there is still a renewed interest in how, how the art pieces that they're selecting support the story of the brand or the company. Um, and I think as people return to hospitality and return to corporate, they're looking for something that's welcoming and that showcases the company's ideal as a whole. And so I, I think we're seeing more commissioned pieces as, as um, Steve was saying, we're seeing more commissioned pieces, more custom pieces, and a lot of consideration about 
what do people see when they walk into our office or into our hotel lobby? Hotels have had have had that um, for a while. Renewed interest from a corporate standpoint about um, the image that is being projected. I, I think that you know we we've done we've done in a very short time. You know we've gone from how do I work from my kitchen table to I have an evolution. Now I've got a home office and I'm working on what does that look like? By the way, I'll volunteer for any television uh, newscaster who still needs to work on their, their bookshelf wall and their- All of them, and their, all you of know, them. I think we'll all volunteer <laughs> for that, but you know, there's an opportunity there. But, but I think we've already evolved from, you know, we, in a very quick evolution through that process. And, and, and people have now figured out how to work comfortably in their home. And, and people are now going to figure, have to figure out a post COVID new corporate environment, right? Hotels are, are, are sl sliding in there. And I think Trina is right. You know, how do I that now welcome in a, a corporate, a new corporate environment that is not dissimilar to what people have been experiencing now for nine months in their extra bedroom, right? This mm -hmm. comfortable space that says, this is your office, but it's really welcoming. And here's how we can make you feel that way by art and other design pieces inside that space that are relevant to the brand, but also relevant to the experience we're trying mm -hmm. to create. And I think that's kind of, uh, it will be a very interesting thing. And I, the peep, the designers that are involved that, that make that successful will be very champions, I think, because that will really help, you know, uh, our economy and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will be an interesting, um, on, on the corporate side, that'll be an interesting transition. Hospitality is gonna be an interesting animal because I still think people, there's gonna be a resistance uh, and how people move through it. And um, I know that our clients are still waiting to see what happens. So on the hospitality side. Yeah, I have, uh, my partner's in commercial um, uh, office interiors. So I get what the industry is from his perspective. Um, obviously it's, you know, it's dead at the moment. Everyone's frozen in their tracks um, because they're evaluating huge real estate, um, you know, commitments. Um, but one of the things that sort of will will change is when people are coming back. There's there's things that your home office doesn't replace for a corporate environment, and that's the interaction of the staff, the collaboration. And so this then it's the focus of what spaces, what kind of environment creates that um, communal kind of work process in a in a deeper way because it has to sort of facilitate um, a different type of work that you you can't do from home and Zoom calls and go to meetings and that sort of thing. And so it really is a kind of interesting. I think you know real estate just um, choices might sh or uh, you know um, sizes might shrink because they maybe are overlapping between home office, um, but certainly there's a different need for how you and communicating brand, communicating your culture when you're in the office is more intense and more important. So I think that's a, a, a very interesting kind of um, what, what 2021 will, you know, will, and beyond will bring um, based on that. Have you heard um, about, have you witnessed or noticed changes for where your clients are, you know, finding art or you mentioned Bruce, a client who, had a new interaction with first dibs um but you know there's first dibs there's auction houses there are galleries um, there are any number of resources but um i'm wondering if you've noticed any changes for where clients might be you know looking for art um, and finding it i mean i thought i thought the first dibs thing was really kind of fascinating because i know that art is on first dibs and you know first dibs is something that all of us designers use whether we're researching you know um, antiques or even new furniture now, but it's never been for me a place where I would go and, and look for art. Um, and for a client to sort of go in that direction because that, you know, some clients are so in, you know, like some clients get out ahead of you and they're like, they're like, they want to finish the internet, you know, finish first dibs so that they know what's going on in the world. But this client was not one of them. And for them to, you know, sort of search out and find um, something like that, I thought, was really telling and really kind of fascinating, you know. Um, and it wasn't even for lack of, you know, she just knew she wasn't comfortable going into galleries. Um, she's a 
immunocompromised, you know, from a, a recent surgery. Um, and, and, you know, and I, I said something about it in our consultant and they didn't take the bait on it. And then next thing you know, she was, there she was figuring it out. But I think it is sort of telling how strongly people are feeling about it. You know, like I, I, I need my world to be complete and beautiful because the exterior world is not available to her. So, you know, um, we were able to, you know, get that done for her, but, um, other than the first dibs, I haven't seen anybody do anything um, else quite that creative. I tend to um, live off of, of, of philosophies that I was taught by my Southern grandparents, you know, so, and one of those things was like fish where the fish are. Uh, and so the, I, I sort of live by w wisdom like that. And so I tend to, um, and my clients, and I teach this to my clients as well is, you know, where, where do artists go when they're looking to find out about other artists or who do they follow or where do they spend their time, right? And, and my, my clients tend to do the same thing. And so if they're on Instagram, find them on Instagram. If they're, if they're on first dibs or, find, or putting themselves out there on first dibs, do that. If they're doing virtual you know, tours of their studios, find those virtual tours. Because I think that, you know, it starts on this, and it starts, everything's grassroots, right? So if it's starting at a grassroots level, somehow it goes from a grassroots level to, you know, a fine gallery like Monique Malosh here in Chicago is doing the same thing. And so I, I think that that's how, what I have found fascinating. You know, some, some artists now that I currently represent, I literally met on Instagram. They followed me. They're like, I like your your ethos, I like your aesthetic, can we talk? And we follow each other for a while, then mm -hmm. we start talking to each other for a while, and the next thing you know, it's FaceTime. And then we, I, I did a, vi a studio visit, we did a mass studio visit, and then I represent them now, right? Mm -hmm. That's one way of it happening. But I, my clients are doing the same thing. Hey, I started following this person on Instagram. What do you think of their art? Well, they're mm -hmm. in London, I haven't seen it live, but I think they're pretty darn good, right? And so I think that that's where, you know, fish where the fish are. Follow how the behaviors of those folks. And I think that that was, is, is sort of a, it's just a philosophy, a philosophy of mine. But I think that that is how artists get to know other artists. Um, I think it's how gallery owners get to know other gallery owners. And it's certainly a way for me to get to know them. Um, mm -hmm. And I, my, my clients are the same and they become hungry that way. And so that's how I know people who are emerging artists, or get to become that way, and, and as well as, as established artists. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a burgeoning world uh, on that, on, in social media. And, um, it, and I don't understand it. So don't, I'm not even professing to begin to know what I'm doing. But I do know that it exists and it's successful. Um, and I happen to have stumbled across some great finds that way. And I think that my, my, my clients um, who, like, not, not unlike Bruce, uh, who will try to go to the very end of the internet to find the solution um, are finding it the same way. So I think that's just one way of really getting out there. And I think there's some very interesting virtual things that will translate into, um, you know, smaller, you know, this, looking at the fairs, traveling to fairs in the future, smaller um, traveling fairs, if you were, if you will. I think there's a, a, an interesting way of, of a virtual um, fair tr translating itself into a smaller physical fair so that there is a tan tangible interaction with the piece. Mm -hmm. I think there would be some interesting, really kind of um, uplifting ways of interacting with art moving forward. I think you're, you're totally right. And adding to that Instagram and um, I think also art schools are, mm -hmm. are, are having a, a huge social media push. And I think it's because it's the same in a lot of cases, it's the same people, digital natives, they're telling their story, they're building their brand. Um, and even before it was cool to be on Instagram, I'd always spend time at the art and design schools because I knew that's where the next thing would come from or the next person would come out of the art schools. And so um, I like being able to connect to emerging artists. And I'm seeing that trend across my clients as well to say, well, what's the next thing? You know, I know I can um, fall in love with a piece or with an artist, but what what's on the horizon? And I think I always look to art schools to help guide that. Also, what can I afford? And 
uh, up and coming artists are yes. great. And yeah. you know, and it's a but it's a in a meaningful way because you don't you can still be serious about art and pay what yeah. your budget is and and then in fact I think part of it is like you were saying it's following the next thing too like what might this person do you know if I'm drawn to this piece of this young artist now and I follow him for 20 years yeah. and maybe I'll find this depth of growth and interest that you know continues or you know or maybe not but I think there is a, an aspect of being connected to the the artist in that manner which is also really important a collection is a broad you know a collection is made up of of, of, of of shallow and deep pieces right yeah and so I think that is um, a really a interesting way and a strong way to develop one. And I think that that's what we're seeing now because, um, you know, it's access has been democratized. And, and I think that is a very uh, telling, he's giving very telling insight to what, what can happen. Well, for a lot of people, you know, one of the most rewarding things about collecting art or, you know, learning about it can be interacting with the artist and it's traditionally been seen as you know you go to an opening or you go to an MFA show and you get to meet the artist you get to talk to them you get to have that interaction but moving it into the the digital realm um, particularly with with platforms like Instagram is definitely I think here to stay that's you know adapted it's accelerated I think for 2020 um, and will be here to stay unless there's a new platform in a few years that you know that would be like friendster or whatever that was you know around a long time ago um there was another question in the in the chat that was sort of answered by this but it says you know please there's I must, somebody who might be an artist saying please share effective ways an emerging artist gets connected to opportunities to sell their work through dealers consultants and designers um if you have something to add beyond just that sort of interaction and 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 following on Instagram, um, that could probably be of interest to artists as well as people on the collecting side to, to be part of that too. Yeah, I'm not afraid of, of having people reach out to me if they're not afraid of also being told uh, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, so I, and, and that's not, and that's, I don't mean that to be a negative thing because there are some people I, I, I'm interested in talking to, but there's some art that is certainly not appealing to me. Um, there are some there are some things that it it just doesn't fit into my world, but it that I may be able to refer them to other people. But I think that just like anything, I I reach out to people I don't know all the time because I'd love to find out more about their product or you know how how they're doing something. And so I would I I'm open to having that same level of exchange or interaction because you absolutely never know what will happen. Um, and if you're right, and and we and we have this simpatico you know interaction it'll it'll work for me and i'll figure out yeah. something yeah a rejection is not necessarily a rejection no it's not a rejection of you or your work it's just a rejection for this right certain situation that can be good practice anyway just hell yeah it, it's worked for me apparently yeah. <laughs> well yeah like um uh the adage you don't ask you don't get you you have to put yourself out there um i think some of like to, to be fair too, like um, art uh, or, um, you know, a silent auction or, or uh, charity events. Um, and I don't know exactly how you get on a circuit of that, but really reaching out to those things um, because I've, you know, I've witnessed plenty of really good, you know, I could say bad art, but really good items that someone just randomly brought to a situation. You've got exposure of X number of people that are going to be seeing it. Um, you know, it, it, I think it's it's about exposure and the right people will connect with the things that resonate and then you kind of build from there so yeah well chicagogallerynews.com if i have a plug does have a whole <laughs> calendar page for benefits and auctions so we have that information there to easily navigate which ones are coming up and since they're all virtual right now it's easier to for people to to do that and to say uh, something i wouldn't have participated in before is suddenly only on my computer and accessible. I mean, that is true for art fairs right now too. Somebody who would not have jetted off to Europe for fairs now suddenly can participate in a way that you just financially or logistically wouldn't have been able to get there. You know, and that extra expense is there's the overhead of getting to you know the the national or international art fair circuit has been eliminated, um, which is another element of a you know, transparency and, and access. 
Yeah, there, I think I'm noticing some of the um, some of these shows are doing a, a local version. Like they may be, you know, digital or online for an international thing. But it's like if you're based in Chicago, our gallery is going to have something associated with this event, for, which I think is just a nice way to kind of still connect the um, the event side of it with a special, you know, exhibit that you can do for a local gallery. And it's you know, then you can control the um, you know, control the, the viewing and all that in a, in a different way or, you know, reasonable way, so. We've seen that some galleries are taking risks as well with what they can showcase in virtual fairs. They can take a different risk to say, I'm going to showcase, you know, these artists individually in a different way that they might not have been able to execute if they're traveling to a physical fair and doing that. So, and they can sometimes, in some cases, participate in more fairs than they may have been in recent years, just because the cost of participating in, in fairs can be prohibitive. Um, if you can participate in a few more that are virtual, and then you're giving extra exposure to artists and, you know, showing, showing collectors things they might not have other seen, otherwise seen. Um, my, one of my final questions um, is do you, to today's challenges or opportunities remind you of anything you have seen in in the past in your career or not? I mean, 2008? <laughs> well, I, 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 kind of, and I, I think it's, under, it's good to explain the difference. I yeah. would love to hear what you think about 2008 and 2009. Well, it's funny because I will say that, you know, over the course of my career, um, there have been several recessions, several moments that have you know, kind of quickly come, come upon us and sort of challenge sort of where, you know, where we're going from here. Um, I think that over the last decade plus, um, for me, it's more how much I've changed to sort of be able to um, recognize opportunity in, in chaos and, and uncertainty and, and, and being optimistic rather than kind of being affected by the the negative part of whatever situation we're in. So I think in that, you know, like we've discussed over this, um, this kind of conversation about um, where access to art, how that's changed, um, opportunities have come out of uh, viewing and, and our clients um, refocusing on things. So I think it's just, for me, I've just learned how to see the opportunity in the, in the um, uncertainty and, and then react to that, you know, and then, to do something in that, in that direction. I think what's um, kind of interesting about the difference between now and 2008 is I think, you know, like we hear the talk about there being two economies. Um, in 2008, that wasn't the case. Um, you know, you heard about people that still had wealth going into Barney's and coming out with a Walgreens bag, you know, cause they didn't want to appear, you know, to be, to, to have, you know, money um, or resources, but now I think it's completely different in, um, people in the financial world don't, you know, aren't taking the blame for this. This is a, you know, a global pandemic. And so I don't think that, you know, a lot of people have curbed their, their, their spending or their ability to acquire things like art and design. Um, so for me, that's really the difference between, you know, then and now, um, is that people are still spending money, even though there's, you know, another part of the economy that that is not. I think I think what what I'm looking at in this is, it's different than 2008 because it's a a multiple part challenge, right? It's not just the pandemic. It's not just social and civil unrest. It's the magnitude of what's happening is bigger. And I think that people are reevaluating their, their position in how they live and where they live. So they're, they're considering the impact of, of how they invest their time and their talents and their money. And that goes into um, their space and what story does that tell? So I think art is certainly viewed differently, but at its core, it hasn't changed because it reflects people and it brings them joy where they are. And so I think that people are seeking additional ways to find joy. We can all look for more of that in this time. Um, 
know, I think that people today versus other times, and you know, we can use 2008 or you know, 1974 as an example, but you know, I, I think people today are making decisions that have a much longer lasting, have longer lasting implications, right? For themselves and their families. I think that they have been exposed to um, decisions they didn't think they would have to make um, for themselves because they've been surrounded by questions that they didn't have to answer in 2008. It wasn't about mm -hmm. race or it wasn't about, you know, will I live my family, you know, is it about my family's health or should we live in the city because it might be dangerous? Should we move to the suburb because it's, you know, our health might be better? You know, those kind of things. So I think that when they're now starting to make you know, they're, they're nesting decisions and the beauty decisions and the subset of people that we're fortunate to work with, you know, on the more affluent side of things. They're making decisions that I think are, you know, um, more longer focused decisions mm -hmm. and that are on the happier side of things, mm -hmm. the more optimistic side of things and things that I think that are, that are um, for the future of themselves and their families. And I think that that is, how I look at it as different. 2008, it was like, how can I save myself? And I think now it's like, how can we save our group, our people, and how can we move forward? And I think that's a much more optimistic point of view. And that's just, you know, that's me and my bubble today. I think sometimes even whether it's fashion or art or design, there also can be, you know, a trickle down that comes from, from what happens at the top, the top of the market to if there are lasting it's decisions and choices that will will be around for a long time. So, Let's hope. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody else have anything else they'd like to to add? I think we we have one other question that I can go into unless you have something to add first. No? Our, our question is must be to all the panelists. Do you favor certain mediums like glass, ceramic? fiber, I, I think in terms of art that perhaps your, your clients would, would be interested in? Are there better price points with certain media um, or do you favor more three-dimensional or two-dimensional art? I'm not sure if this person's asking as an artist perhaps. Maybe you just, if, there, if there's art that you personally, <laughs> personally collect. Well, I think sometimes for me, you know, photography is something that has, um, uh, can have a wide range of sort of entry points um, of, uh, you know, it might be uh, priced if, if starting to, to build around things that are, um, you know, kind of smaller to larger kind of uh, scaled um, or invest, investment in pieces. So I think sometimes starting in photography can be an interesting way of introducing a client to things that are um, maybe ex an accessibility thing as well. Um, but I think for mediums, I, I think that uh, that's a, I say that's such a personal um, kind of question. Um, I, I don't know, um, you know, the, the range of what financially things are um, may have different uh, price points. I just kind of believe you, uh, you gravitate towards the things that that feel meaningful and that could be in oils or photography or in glass or, you know, some sculpture, but um, yeah, I think that's kind of, um, I'm, I don't direct a client in any specific mode, although I like to Gil's point, there's things I know what I like and things that I don't like. Mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not a personal um, commentary on the art. It's, it's a more about what it means to me and how I see that translating into, into an environment. So um, that's usually where I start. Yeah, I think similarly, you know, I don't have a preference or steer a client one way or the other, but I think, you know, as, as a designer, when you bring multiple mediums together, that's where the interest really lies, right? And the, in the push and pull of those different mediums and different spaces. And so as you're thinking about moving a client through the space, you know, maybe you've thought this is a great place for sculpture here. And then as we're going around, here's a great wall for um, a painting or here's something where we can do, use textiles. 
keep that in mind in your head as you go through the space and what the client and what the user sees. Um, but certainly the more you can bring um, a varied collection, in my opinion, um, the, the richer that experience will be. I, um, I personally just um, did a collection on a wall in my house in Michigan that I probably have 20 or 30 pieces on. Um, we just hung it and it is a little bit of everything. There's a wood block, there's a photograph, there's um, a sculptural, you know, ceramic piece, um, you know, and it's definitely high to low. Um, it's all over the map, but when it all comes together like that, um, it is really beautiful. And it's, you know, the multiple pieces come together as part of, you know, a singular collection mm -hmm. and it adds so much texture and interest. Um, and then while I was thinking about this, I re remember that I purchased probably 90% of those pieces um, at auction. Um, so that's one thing that I think we didn't, you know, that I didn't think of um, to recommend, but, you know, there's a lot of auctions. And of course, you know, in, in every case, it's always buyer beware, right? You have to really be careful and know your auction house, but um, that's a really interesting place to be able to, um, you know, find things and, and, and again, it, it, many different price points all over the place. I like it all. <laughs> well, somebody just asked if any of your clients are interested in digital media, video art, sound environments. And I, I, it's funny you say that because we have a client in, in California and um, one of their first requests was, how do we incorporate digital? I'm a tech person yep. and as art, right? And so mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, a ch I challenged not in a bad way. It was the like this incredible challenge to be not only to you know find the right artist, but to find the right use in the, in a space that was you know to be uh, that was going to be really unique to begin with. But uh, um, you know we're still hunting, but it's uh, it's a good it's so it's yes people are interested in it. Um, I, I, I I'm going to tell you the percentage is small. They always find it fascinating, but they never know where it's going to fit where it'll where it'll fit. Well, I, I think one of the interesting challenges with digital art is um, oftentimes it needs to be projected onto something or it needs to be plugged in. Right. And so I had that challenge with a client where it was, I don't remember the name of the artist, but it was basically a framed iPad that was Albert Einstein repeating on it. And it was really cool and interesting and added so much interest to the collection. But we literally stuck a hole in the wall through and plugged it in on the other side because she, you know the client was like I don't want to put an outlet behind it and where would you hide the cord I mean it was just such a funny thing to try to figure out you know where yes. you plug the digital art in uh, but you know it, it turned out beautifully and totally worked so I think there's a, a vehicle for the um, uh, for the uh, the video like the if it's the screen the the mon you know the monitor the what it that technology changes so much that it's just what you think of something that's 10 years old and there's a 40 inch screen massive monitor and it's sometimes you can't help but you know kind of you see the monitor as you see the the art it's like you know and so if it's projected that kind of can separate that bit but i've have clients where you're like okay that's just sort of this curious it's very period because you know by the the age of the monitor what when that piece of art was done. There's an interesting reading about, you know, the conservation elements of digital art and what yeah. has to be done to preserve it. Exactly, yeah. Well, I would say thank you for the opportunity today to connect and share your insights. Um, I would be very interested to see what this conversation would reveal, you know, a year from now. <laughs> Hopefully we're, maybe we'll all be together in person. Um, but, but this was a great opportunity today to to have this discussion. Um, so thank you to each of you and thank you to Intersect and to the River North Design District. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. This is great. And thank you, Trina, Jill, Steve, Bruce, and Jill Merrimont for organizing. Um, and you know, I think to that point, it's very interesting to sort of see what, not just a year from now, that time capsule, but if you were to think back to those feelings you had in 2008, and how different they feel now and what the next sort of crisis will look like and how we've taken away things from this time and learned from it and really sort of embraced um, 
positivity and creativity in this moment. So thank you all for sharing your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye, thank you.